young and old, rich and poor, male and female, the religious, the irreligious, the healthy, the sick. These were just some of the people that Jesus met during the course of his ministry as recorded for us in the Gospels. And as I read the encounters of Jesus that he had with people, people he met, I don't think there are two encounters that are ever exactly the same. There's no cookie cutter approach to Jesus. He treats people as individuals and he sees them in their need and he speaks what they need to speak, even if it's sometimes what they don't wanna hear. He brings his challenge. And some of the people Jesus met respond to him, they embrace him because they recognize that he's the Messiah, God come in the flesh, the one that can save them. But then there are many others who we know after their encounter with Jesus reject him. There's a growing hatred in their hearts, this anger, the seething anger kind of continues to grow towards him and and, and increases as they become hostile to him as he goes to the cross. And then there's still others that meet with him and they're kind of rattled in their souls because uh, Jesus confronts them, but their hearts are so hard, they kind of leave unchanged. But know this, that everybody responds to meeting Jesus in some way. And that might be you this morning. You're either gonna respond by accepting him and embracing him or by rejecting him. I don't think anyone can remain neutral to the name and the person and the work of Jesus Christ. And so we begin a sermon series uh, this morning that I've called People Jesus Met. And we're gonna look at seven people that Jesus met uh, over the course of the ministry uh, that that he had on earth. And so many I could have chosen. The community groups are also studying some that are different from the ones. I think there's some overlap. uh, And we're gonna study that until uh, our new senior pastor arrives, as I said, in the middle of March. And in each counter, that Jesus has, I think you're gonna see something of yourself. And there might be one or two encounters where you say, hey, that's me. I can really see myself in that man or woman or child. But I think more importantly, in each encounter, I'm hoping that we'll see Christ afresh. We'll see something of his beauty and something of just his challenge to each one of us. And my prayer is that Jesus would meet you where you're at this morning. And I don't know what you've brought into this new year. I don't know if it was a good time over the festive season or not. I don't know what's on the horizon, but what I do know is that if Christ can meet this diversity of people, he can certainly meet you where you're at. People Jesus met. May your name and mine be included in that number. So I want you to turn with me to Luke chapter five. Luke chapter five, it's on page 59 in the New Testament, page 59 in the New Testament, Luke chapter five. The account is slightly longer. I'm just gonna focus on just two verses, verses 12 to 13 of Luke five. I think we know that this is an important account because it features in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. So if three of the gospel writers pick up this account, then it must be important. So let's see who Jesus meets today. Page 59, Luke chapter five, verses 12 to 13. While Jesus was in one of the towns, a man came along who was covered with leprosy. When he saw Jesus, he fell with his face to the ground and begged him, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing he said, be clean, and immediately the leprosy left him. Leprosy has to be one of the worst diseases known to man. I think there are few diseases that dehumanize a person's body beyond recognition, Uh, and if you've ever looked for photographs or seen people afflicted with leprosy, uh, there's there's almost something monstrous about that look, and we, we, we have to look away, perhaps in fear. E.W.G. Masterman writes, no other disease reduces a human being for so many years to so hideous a wreck. William Barclay in his commentary writes, it might begin with little nodules which go on to ulcerate. The ulcers develop a foul discharge, the eyebrows fall out, the eyes become staring, the vocal cords become ulcerated and the voice becomes hoarse and the breath wheezes. Slowly the sufferer becomes a mass of ulcerated growths. Leprosy might begin with a loss of all sensation in some part of the body. 
The nerve trunks are affected. The muscles waste away. The tendons contract until the hands are like claws. There follows ulceration of the hands and feet. Then comes the progressive loss of fingers and toes until in the end a whole hand or a whole foot may drop off. The duration of that kind of leprosy is anything from 20 to 30 years. It is a kind of terrible progressive death in which a man dies by inches. What a graphic description of, of, of just this disease in which a man dies by inches. Leprosy today is known as Hansen's disease. And you might know of the incredible work that Dr. Paul Brand did, particularly in India, over many, many decades in the area of leprosy. Dr. Brand sadly passed away in 2003, but his work at the time was revolutionary. You see, up until the point of Dr. Brand's work, it was thought that leprosy caused that it actually caused these ulcerations and all of these things. And what Dr. Brand showed beyond any doubt is that leprosy only is, causes those things in an indirect kind of way. What leprosy does is it's like an anesthetic. It numbs, it begins to spread through your body and numb your entire body. So the damage we see is actually done by leprosy patients themselves because they have no feeling. And so they handle the mop too strongly or they sprained their ankle but they couldn't feel the pain and where you and I would adjust our walk because we've got a bit of pain, so they would just continue to walk and wear down their, their toes and their feet until they were just nubs. And so that's the danger of this disease, leprosy, is that it numbs and deadens the extremities. Dr. Brand tells of a leper who put his hand into a raging fire because someone had accidentally dropped a potato and there this leprosy patient just put his hand into the coals to get the potato out, not being aware of how much damage he'd done to his hands because he couldn't feel anything. Leprosy patients damage their eyes because you and I know to blink or we get something in there, even something as small as an eyelash or some dust. But a leprosy patient can't feel once that, that, that disease is spread to their eyes and so they forget to blink or every morning they're washing their face and have no idea how hot the water is and so over time they're burning away their eyelids and doing irreparable damage. We all long to live in a utopia that doesn't have any pain and Dr. Brand says that utopia that we think is utopia is called a leper colony. And he wrote a book together with Philip Yancey called The Gift of Pain, saying we always want to get rid of pain, but actually, do we ever see pain as a gift? Leprosy patients don't experience pain, and yet it causes a deep, deep pain. In fact, Dr. Brand recounts how one day he went to, to fetch something out of a, a storeroom at the back of the hospital where he worked, and as he went out there, here was the padlock slightly rusted with this old key, and he tried everything, and he couldn't get this padlock to open. And one of the youngest patients there was walking past at the time, a 10-year-old boy, and he said, oh, doctor, I'll help you, and he just went and with one motion managed to open this rusted padlock. And Dr. Brand says he wondered to himself, how could a boy half his size with half of his strength exert such force until he saw drips of blood? And then he looked at the boy's hand and the boy had turned it so hard without being aware of his strength that it had gone right through to the bone, exposing the joints of his hand. Well, the man Jesus met in Luke chapter five is a leper. And leprosy in Bible times referred to all kinds of skin diseases, but the text explicitly tells us that this kind of leprosy is exactly what we've been talking about because maybe you missed it in verse 12. Our text tells us he was covered with leprosy. Covered with leprosy. The Greek text literally says he was full of leprosy. This was advanced stages. So much damage had been done perhaps over decades. And rabbis of the day said that it was as hard to heal someone of leprosy as it was to raise somebody from the dead. And it's interesting that, that leprosy was just that. It was a death sentence. It was incurable at the time. Nothing could be done. And we're grateful for modern medicine, which at least before you have done damage can, can reverse uh, some of the effects. But I think even worse than the physical condition that I've described is the spiritual and emotional stigma and trauma and the isolation from community that leprosy brought. The law in the Old Testament said the following in Leviticus 13 verse 45. The law said the person with such an infectious disease must wear torn clothes, so they've got to rip their clothes so people can see. 
They must let his hair be unkempt, must cover the lower part of his face and cry out, unclean, unclean. As long as he has the infection, he remains unclean. He must live alone and he must live outside the camp. The only solution if you were affected by leprosy was quarantine. To live outside the camp, can we fathom? Let's just put ourselves for a moment in this man's situation to live alone when we were designed for community, when we were designed for intimacy. Think of all that he lost never being able to touch his wife again, to embrace his children, to lose his job and his career, to lose his place of worship, not to be allowed to go close to God's house even because he was unclean, to live and to walk around with this stigma and to to even have to wear a bell that would just ring, kind of like a cow or uh, just to alert people that this unclean person was coming near and if he came near, he had to shout out unclean as though his face and his body wasn't enough to warn people. Think of the emotional and spiritual pain, the shame that this brought to his soul. He may not have been able to feel on the outside but he certainly felt on the inside. I read of one rabbi who warned people not to come within a hundred cubits downwind of a leper to avoid defilement. So there's the leper, oh, the wind's blowing this way. Let me not even get within 40 to 50 meters in case I'm defiled. Another rabbi boasted that he would not even eat an egg that had been bought in a street where a leper had perhaps walked past. Max Lucado in his beautiful retelling of the story of this leper tries to help us to understand something of what the leper must have felt as he began to realize that he had contracted this disease. It's a much longer story and I've just summarized the beginning part and Lucado always writes so beautifully and creatively. So let's hear what this man felt in the first person. One year during harvest, my grip on the scythe seemed weak. The tips of my fingers numbed, first one finger, then another. Within a short time, I could grip the tool but scarcely feel it. By the end of the season, I felt nothing at all. The hand grasping the handle might as well have belonged to someone else. The feeling was gone. I said nothing to my wife, but I know she suspected something. How could she not? I carried my hand against my body like a wounded bird. One afternoon, I plunged my hands into a basin of water, intending to wash my face. The water reddened. My finger was bleeding, bleeding freely. I didn't even know I was wounded. How did I cut myself? On a knife? Did my hand slide across the sharp edge of a metal surface? It must have, but I I didn't feel anything. It's on your clothes too, my wife said softly. She was behind me. Before looking at her, I looked down at the crimson spots on my robe. For the longest time, I stood over the basin, staring at my hand, Somehow I knew my life was forever being altered. Shall I go with you to tell the priest, she asked. No, I sighed, I'll go alone. I turned and looked into her moist eyes. Standing next to her was our three-year-old daughter. Squatting, I gazed into her face and stroked her cheek, saying nothing. What could I say? I stood and looked again at my wife. She touched my shoulder and with my good hand I touched hers. It would be our final touch. No one has touched me since. Now as we think of this man's predicament in a different time, in a different place and with a disease that maybe is foreign to us, a disease that's even changed its name over the years. How do we relate to this man this morning? Well I think we're supposed to see that we are just like him. I think we're supposed to see at a spiritual level that you and I are spiritual lepers. We're actually no different from him. The problem is not that we're wasting away on the outside. The problem is that we're wasting away on the inside. Spiritual leprosy has affected every single one of us. We're all contaminated and it has affected every part of us. There's not one part of our being that's not affected by sin, whether it's our thoughts, whether it's our emotions, whether it's our behavior, our actions, our conscience, it's all affected by the spiritual disease. And while his leprosy wasn't caused by his sin, because people would say, he must have done something wrong, while in some sense he was an innocent victim, at another level, because of Adam and Eve's sin, death and pain and cursing and and 
disease has entered the world. And so because of a result of that, yes, his disease is the result of sin, sin corporately. But in the same way, our spiritual death is a picture of that sin that has entered our lives and into our worlds. And in the scriptures, leprosy is a kind of a parable of spiritual death. Paul reminds us in Ephesians 2 and verse 1, as for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. Dead. I know we feel alive. I know it feels like we, we're doing okay, but we're actually spiritually dead, says the scriptures. We have a death sentence over our lives, and apart from Christ, we will die without God and without hope in the world. We too are separated from God because of our sin. We cannot find our way back to him because we are isolated. Josephus, the Jewish historian, said that lepers were treated as if they were, in effect, dead men. What a picture, dead men walking. And you might be here this morning and say, well, I've come into this new year, I don't feel spiritually dead. Maybe you don't see the numbness, maybe you don't recognize, if you don't know Christ, that you're actually spiritually dead and there's no way that you can make yourself alive. You may look alive, but we all have this leprous condition. And then there's some of us who, in some sense, have not actively rebelled against God, but we're the victims of other people's sins. And I know as I look out across this auditorium, this auditorium is filled with people who have been bruised and battered and hurt by people, betrayed by people, perhaps overlooked by people. Maybe you're invisible to some people. It's as if you don't exist. And how do you ever trust people again if they've hurt you so deeply? The scars are deep in your life because you have been the victim of other people's sin and cruelty and maybe it's gone on for years and maybe there are things in your past. Maybe you've been hurt by the church and you've been burnt and here you are this morning and you're wondering, well, when am I gonna get hurt again? How do I trust people again when I've been scarred? What do we do with those bruises and the wounds? We isolate ourselves, we pull back from community because we say, well, I got burnt once. We withdraw. We have to find a way to self-protect. But from the word of God this morning, I want to show you that there's a better way. There's a better way. And this leper knew that he was unclean, but he also believed that Christ had the power to cleanse him. And that's a beautiful thing. Some people believe that they're too unclean to come to Christ. I remember a young guy caught up in drug addiction and he just said, I wish I was dead now. God should send me to hell. That's what I deserve. And I would talk about grace and talk about forgiveness. No, God can't forgive me. I'm too bad. My shame runs too deep. And maybe that's you this morning. You just look at your, the past months of this holiday and you think, here I am, but I'm just feeling unworthy to even be here. And I can see the looks from people. Maybe I'm being judged. And it's, when you're in that situation and people I've sat with, they just say, I can't come into church because people are staring at me. I'm sure they're judging. And, and half of it's just in their own minds. But then there's people on the other side who also won't come to Christ and it's because they think they're too good. Their lives are together. They're pretty people who look great and so they don't need Christ. You really, in this day and age, you want to tell me that I'm a sinner separated from God? And so we have these two extremes but the leper said, I recognize, I'm gonna be honest in looking at myself in the mirror and I, I'm facing my leprous condition and I'm also facing the fact that Christ can restore me, that he can. And so I love this man's faith. Look at his humility, he falls to his feet before Jesus. Look at his courage. What kind of courage to just press through the crowd knowing that people are gonna be shielding their children from this guy. It's like, don't look there, this hideous monster. And people just scampering back. Why is he coming out from behind the trees and, and, and here into the city, what is he doing? And his courage, he just presses in because he's desperate. He's recognized his true condition and he longs to be clean. And so our text tells us that when he saw Jesus, he fell with his face to the ground and begged him, Lord, and he calls him Lord. Even though he might not technically be a Christian, he recognizes Christ's lordship. Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. And I believe this passage invites us to see two things about Jesus here. We've seen a little bit about this man and his courage and his humility, his desperation, but let's look at two things about Jesus. Number one, the heart of Jesus. I want us to see into Jesus' heart. Don't you wanna know sometimes, how does Jesus feel about me? How does he feel about my brokenness? How does he feel about my pain? How does he feel about my rejection and what I'm going through? 
Jesus' emotions are powerful and it's sadness that throughout church history we have failed to study Jesus' emotions more. It's been a side hobby of mine for the last two decades. Around the turn of the millennium, I started to study Jesus' emotions and a theology of emotion because it's one of the most neglected parts of our theology. And I can think of only one book in history apart from the last 10 to 20 years that ever covered this. It's a book by B.B. Warfield, The Person and Work of Christ, and he has a whole chapter called The Emotional Life of Our Lord. Jesus was fully man. He experienced the full range of emotions, and they're all there, but somehow we think Jesus is cold and uncaring. And what we see in our text as we, as, as we peer through into Jesus' heart, we see he's accessible and available. He's not like our, our modern preachers who have their bodyguards and they invite you to come to these healing rallies but you can't really get near because everything's pre-planned and so orchestrated and bodyguards are saying, this guy's coming, they keep him away and when things get too much, the guy's able to disappear into his private jet and get away from people and sit in his jacuzzi. That's not Jesus. Jesus is accessible. He's available, anybody can come. There's no hoops you have to jump through. That's the joy of the gospel. There's no to-do list or resolutions I've got to give you and say, okay, well come to the front and I'm gonna give you a 10 point plan and then maybe we'll let you in the back room and you can see Jesus. But uh, we're not letting you in there until you've jumped through these hoops. You don't need a mediator. You don't need a priest to go and beg your cause. He is the priest, he is the mediator and you can come as you are. So why don't you come? Why are you holding at him, him at arm's length? Why won't you come? And when we look into the heart of Jesus, we see his compassion. He's compassionate. The parallel account in Mark chapter one is very clear. Mark says to us, Jesus was filled with compassion when he saw this man. The Greek is so descriptive. It's almost as though he moves towards him. In compassion, he moves towards him. In the deepest part of Jesus' heart, he is moved for what this man has been through. And I believe that Christ moves towards you this morning in your pain and your brokenness and shame. He sees, he feels, and he is moved. And he was willing to move an infinite distance from heaven to come to Bethlehem, which we've just celebrated. He's not annoyed by you coming. I don't think there's a pastor that doesn't sometimes get annoyed. Why, because we're human beings. We get annoyed, it's, we, we get burdened, and Jesus was a man as well. We read that he got tired, but, but we never read that he got annoyed. You're not an irritation to him, so why not come afresh to him today? Do you really wanna go back to your old life of leprosy, so to speak, that you were living in 2019? That life in isolation from God, going it alone. Aren't you tired of going it alone, living it in your own strength, trying to clean up your act on your own? Just push through the crowd, so to speak. Maybe your spouse is with you. Maybe you've got friends and family who would think, what now, this nut is going to church and now he's getting religious? This leper wasn't cared what people thought. He recognized his need, he saw who Jesus was and he pressed through and he wasn't worried about the embarrassment from people. Come with a deep awareness of your uncleanness and what Jesus can do to make you clean and know that he moves in compassion towards you as you come. William Barclay says, To a good doctor, a man sick with a loathsome disease is not a disgusting spectacle. He's a human being who needs his skill. Think about that, imagine you go and see your doctor and your doctor is is grossed out by something you tell. Tell them, it's just like, oh, you know, I I need to have my water removed. It's like, nobody wants to go to a doctor that's grossed out by things. I don't know how doctors do it. They must have some coping mechanisms, but that's the doctor's skill, I'm here to help you. And Barclay goes on and says, to a doctor, a child sick with an infectious disease is not a menace. He's a child who needs to be helped. Which one of your parents looks at your child and says, oh, I don't really wanna get flu now. Well, let's just leave them in the room for a week. We can just throw food in 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 the cot. No, you move towards that. You're not even thinking about that. And Barclay says, Jesus was like that. God is like that. We must be like that. The true Christian will break any convention and will take any risk to help a fellow man in need. That's what sent Dr. Paul Brand to India. That's what sent people across the world into some of the dirtiest places and broken places with no thought to themselves because they were modeling what our God looks like who would humble himself and take sin upon himself. And look at what happens when the man comes to Jesus. 
Did you notice he doesn't doubt Jesus' ability to cleanse him? That's not even the question here. But he does have a question about Jesus' willingness. Will he be willing? I don't doubt his ability, but will he be willing? And in humility, he falls before Jesus. And as we look at the spectacle, you can imagine if you were in the crowd of the day, I mean, your fear of contracting what is this horrendous disease, and you're gonna say, will this holy rabbi shout out unclean? Will he step back in horror? What's he gonna do? He's certainly not gonna get too near to this guy. What would you have done with this man if you were there with your children in the crowd that day? You see, I think we're people who often don't wanna get involved in the mess of people's lives. We look at some situations and we say, that's too messy, that's too complicated. I'm just here in my ivory tower. Maybe we look at people that work in Rays of Hope and, and we just say, oh, well, we admire them, but you know, that, that's not me. And, and, and we see people with problems and, and we just shy away from them. That, that's maybe our natural response. I'm not gonna get involved in the mess. But I want to see Jesus willing. He says, I'm willing, willing to get involved. I don't know why. Why would God be willing to get involved in, in our mess? He should have written us off. But we see from the text that Jesus is willing. He's not too busy. He's not too cynical. He's, he's not like a 45-year-old who's just now depressed about life and his midlife crisis. No. He enters our world. He comes close. He's not harsh. He's gentle. And we see how he feels about people who've lost hope. Now just think about how you are spiritually like this leper. If we're all lepers, as we've said, then there are only two kinds of lepers in this congregation this morning. Number one, they're those who are self-aware. They're humble and honest enough to say, I identify with a leper because I know my heart, I know my true condition. That my life is wasting away apart from the beauty and the glory and the majesty and the willingness of Jesus to meet with me. If I go out alone, I know how I mess it up. If I cut myself off from, from the church and our fellowship and all the means of grace that God has given, but most of all, if I, if I have a hardened heart towards Christ, then, then I know that I'm nowhere spiritually. Those people recognize that they desperately need Jesus, not just for some prayer they prayed 10 years ago, but on a daily basis, not just once a year in January. They're desperate for his touch, and they recognize, I need his touch again in 2020. Let's forget about 2019. Lord, I need you today. But there's a second type of leper in the congregation this morning, and that's those who live out of touch with reality. The pretty people I spoke about, the people who try and clean up their act, they behave before Jesus. They try and just put on some clothing, try and just spray themselves so they look less leperish. They won't face their leprosy in the mirror. They won't be honest with themselves. They try and cover and hide. And instead of seeing Jesus as compassionate and willing, they see him more like a boss. He's this cruel taskmaster. I've just got to keep performing. He's not this God of love. He's only a God of justice. And I don't know about you, maybe when you come to church or you're around God's people, or maybe when you think about Jesus, you're just always a bit on edge. You're just always feeling a little bit nervous. Have I done enough? Oh, last year I messed up, but I've got to try and clean up my act this year. That's not the gospel. That's trying to save yourself. That's trying to hide behind your own efforts. That's trying to cover up your leprosy. Have I done enough to sort out my life? But this leper just came and said, no, I haven't. I can't sort out my life but that's why I come to Christ. Nothing in my hand I bring, says the hymn writer, simply to your cross I cling. And so this room could be full of pretty people, nice people who have it all together. We've got our houses and our cars and our accomplishments and our office in Santon and all the things that we look to to give us meaning in life. And we believe we have it all together, and if we do get into trouble, we've got some backup measures. We can get ourselves out of this mess. We can get ourselves back on track. We've even dragged ourselves to church again. So here we are. You see, I've got my self-made plan of salvation. But Jesus wants you to come, to come simply. Well, we've seen Jesus' heart, but there's something else that we must see. We mustn't just see his heart, we must see his hands. We see hands that are filled with pity and hands that are filled with power. And the cry came in this raspy leper voice, if you are willing, you can make me clean. In verse 13, such a moving verse and we can miss this. Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, he said, be clean and immediately the leprosy left him. 
Jesus stretched out his hand and he touched the leper in a flash in a moment. We don't know how, we're not given details where, where some of his limbs restored, was the, the disease stopped in its tracks, we, we don't know, but it just says he was cleansed, he was, he was healed in that moment. His shame and the years of scar, scars were taken away. And just imagine his joy, being able to know, it just dawned on him, I can go and hug my wife. I can go and embrace my children. Maybe it had been decades. Maybe he hadn't even seen them and what had developed in their lives and the families that they had and perhaps grandchildren. Just to be in community. Just to be held again. Just to feel the touch and the warmth of people. To be comforted. I don't need to tell you how powerful a thing touch is. Appropriate touch. Yes, it's also abused and we have sexual harassment and all this, but but let's, let's not let all those negatives cloud what is beautiful. Appropriate touch, one of the five love languages. The research that has been done about how even just a, a, an appropriate touch can improve your immune system and release all sorts of chemicals. And Jesus reaches out and touches this man and does something even deeper than that. Can I ask you, why did Jesus touch him? Why? Couldn't Jesus just have cured him with a word? Couldn't he have just said, be clean? Why did he touch him? Couldn't he have just prayed a prayer and said, Father, it's your will, won't you heal this man? Why did he get involved and actually reach out and touch him? Think no one had touched this man since the day he was pronounced unclean. And perhaps it had been decades, but Jesus touches him. He wanted to do more than heal him. He wanted to show him that you are loved, that you are special, that you are validated, that you have dignity. Jesus wanted to show him what compassion feels like. Not just talk about compassion, he wanted him to feel what his willingness to heal him felt like. This leper was unworthy of the touch of man, and yet he was worthy of the touch of God. Just let that sink in. Unworthy of the touch of man, and yet he was worthy of the touch of God. I think Jesus was doing far more with his touch than we even see at first. As we said, the rabbi said it was as hard to cure leprosy as it was to raise somebody from the dead. And you know what? Jesus comes onto the scene and he says, I'll do both of those things. Jesus came not only to cleanse, but he also came to take our leprosy sin upon himself and put it to death on the cross once and for all. So yes, it's true. Jesus does touch the man. But you know what's happening in that process? When Jesus touches the man in a symbolic way, he is taking his leprosy upon himself as a foreshadowing of the cross. That's what Leviticus tells us in Leviticus, I think it's chapter five, that to touch uncleanness was to become unclean yourself. So think about this, in touching him, in touching the leper, Jesus is becoming a leper himself. Everyone would have gasped and stepped back. He's now contaminated in some ways. We know that he wasn't truly contaminated because he was the son of God. But in a symbolic way, yes he was because this was the foreshadowing of all of our sin that he would take to the cross and once and for all put it to death. The perfectly holy one stepped towards uncleanness and he imputes his righteousness, his cleanness into the man and symbolically takes that man's uncleanness into himself. This divine exchange. That's why Paul writes in 2 Corinthians chapter five. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And as Jesus hung on that cross, he was cursed. He was disfigured. He was jeered at. People shook their heads at a distance. He was abandoned. He was betrayed. And then at the last moment, even his own father turned his face away from him and he cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken him? He was being abandoned in our place so that we could be accepted as he was raised to life. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. So this morning at the this January of 2020, won't you come to Jesus and just allow him to touch you afresh? Won't you recognize that you have a deep need, that he is what you're looking for? Perhaps you've been living for so long in the leper colony and your heart is so numb that you don't even notice your condition anymore because it's the new norm. And maybe you've come into 2020 and if you're honest, your heart is numb towards God. You're here. But the, but the feeling, you've still got this heart of stone and, and, and God needs to come again and give you a heart of flesh. Maybe it's just been the slow process as you look back over the last couple of years of spiritual atrophy. Just sense again where your heart is hard and come. 
I want you to encourage this morning. I'm gonna give you an opportunity to respond and to come to the front and to kneel on the steps here. It's a symbolic gesture that, Lord, I'm coming. Like the leper, I'm not worried, Lord, about what people think of me. I'm not worried about what they may say. But, Lord, I've recognized my need that apart from you I can do nothing. And Lord, I come and I symbolically bow before you. And Lord, without you touching my heart again, Lord, I'm tired of just trying to clean up my act. Then I wanna encourage you to come. We're gonna play a song. It's a beautiful hymn that we sing often. Jesus paid it all. It talks about the leper who can't change his spots. And Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. There's nothing magical about coming and kneeling in the front. You can kneel where you're at. You can sit in your seat. But you might want to this morning do something that you will remember outwardly. And sometimes we need those outward things to remind us that Christ is here and he longs to move towards us and to touch us. And ask him to work through your hands that you would be then willing to go and touch the untouchable, to go to places and de- deal with people that you think, mm, maybe I wouldn't normally, but I have received such touching grace that I can't help but extend it. Come. He's willing to welcome and embrace all of those who will recognize their need. So I invite you to come. The song's five minutes, and at the end, I'll pray for us and commit us to the Lord. But come and do business with God and allow him to meet with you at the start of this year.